Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director for our Equifax risk portfolio. For this episode, we're turning our spotlight to the mortgage industry. In addition to economic headwinds, we're seeing high mortgage rates, low housing supply, and a tightening of mortgage credit availability. What does this mean for the future of the industry, and where does this leave our consumers? On May 18th, in our Market Pulse webinar, our guest Joel Kahn, Vice President and Deputy Chief Economist for the Mortgage Bankers Association, predicted that mortgage originations will decline 20% this year, but they will increase 25% next year. Joel joins us again today on this platform to expound further on those predictions and the state of the mortgage market, plus answer questions submitted by our recent webinar attendees. But first, we'll start with an economic update from David Fieldhouse of Moody's Analytics. David? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, The GDP for Q1 has been revised upward to an annual growth of 1.3%. There will be probably a cool down throughout 2023. Um, Unfortunately, we're seeing inventory growth has decreased with a drop of 0.2% in wholesale inventories in April. And we're seeing the international trade deficit widen to 96.8 billion as exports decreased and imports increased. On a positive note, personal income grew by 0.4% in April. Uh, And while real disposable income saw a significant a uh, gain of 7.8% thanks to cost of living adjustments. Um, however, spending growth is challenged by real, real income growth going forward, high inflation, soaring interest rates, and weak house prices. The savings rate has dropped to 4.1% in April, indicating a larger drawdown in household savings than previously assumed. Policymakers at the Federal Reserve hold different opinions on how to tackle inflation. The PC deflator, which increase by 0.4% in April might push some towards further tightening. Liquidity issues and congressional inability to raise the debt limit may lead to over-tightening by the Federal Reserve. Uh, The manufacturing sector is also facing ongoing concerns. As revealed by the Richmond Fed uh, manufacturing survey, consumer spending is cooling, credit conditions are, are affecting business and residential investments. Consumer sentiment remains low, as per the University of Michigan index, despite improvements in the labor market. On the other hand, Conference Board's measures are showing an increased in confidence. These measures don't always match up, and and we're seeing a little bit of that uh, coming through here on the two different measures. On a positive element, uh, U.S. new home sales in April rose by nearly 12% compared to last year. The U.S. job openings have also increased to 10.1 10.1 million, reverse a decline observed in the first quarter. Job crit rate and uh, predictor of wage growth dropped to its lowest since early 2021 at 2.4%. Fed Chair Jerome Powell suggested a decrease in job openings could help cool wage growth without increasing unemployment. However, uh, April's job opening increase is not expected to cause panic among Fed officials. The upcoming uh, Federal Open Market Committee meeting in June will likely see a pause in rate hikes. And uh, going forward, we're expecting about 215,000 jobs to be created in May. That's the prediction that we have here at Moody's Analytics. Thank you very much, Catherine. Okay, thanks, David. And Joel, thank you for being here. Catherine, hi. Thanks for having me. I look forward to our discussion. Yes. Thanks for coming back for a second round with Equifax. Um, Would love to get your brief overview of the mortgage industry and and where you're seeing things as they stand today. Sure. So it is shaping up to be a pretty challenging year for lenders. Mortgage rates are around 6.7% right now. They were just below 4% at the beginning of 2022. So as you'd imagine, that's taken many potential borrowers out of the market. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at the purchase side of the market, higher rates have have really significantly reduced purchasing power for many potential home buyers. And the for sale inventory is still really low. So we're seeing the current pace of application activity, purchase application activity, well behind the pace of the last three years. Additionally, we saw lots of refinance and purchase activity in 2020 when mortgage rates were in the three to four percent range. So that really, there aren't many people looking to refinance either because they have these low rates. And again, with rates over 6% right now, there's not a lot of incentive for them. 
So what our expectation is for this year, we expect about a 20% decline in origination volume for 2023 relative to 22. But we do expect a 25% increase in 2024 if we see the the demand or a a return of demand and also see additional housing inventory. And if we see mortgage rates finally start to settle back down, perhaps even hitting the the 5% range. Mm, thank you. That That's helpful. So I, I want to jump to many of the questions that we got from our webinar attendees, since we always encourage that. So let's dig into some of those. One that came through was, what are your thoughts on investment or non-owner occupied mortgages? So we did see spurts of activity in the investor purchase segment in 2020 and 21, when people had extra savings from just really not being able to do a whole lot of discretionary spending during the pandemic. Everyone was stuck at home and we got some fiscal stimulus. You know, rates were low, obviously, at the time. And there was also this realization that there was a demand for short-term rentals as remote workers wanted to venture out during the pandemic and work from somewhere more exciting, perhaps. That has cooled off since then. I think now we're actually at a time where we're maybe it's shifted to, to more unintentional investors. And what I mean by that is, we uh, have lots of homeowners who locked in low rates over the last two, three years and just don't want to sell their homes because they're going to give up three, you know, three and a half percent, 30 or fixed in order to buy a new house. So what they're doing is they're keeping these homes with the current mortgages on them and they're renting them out. So, yes, we did see a change in the non-owner occupied segment of the market. But I think, you know, we're seeing sort of more unintentional landlords, if you will, because of the rate environment. Mm. Okay, Joel, I'm going to read you this next question, and part of it's not a question, so here here goes. Given the supply constraint, are you expecting stress on the investment loans volume, or would this be another drive to keep housing prices elevated? Although demographic support for demand is there, affordability has become a challenge for many potential borrowers. Yeah, Catherine, that's a, that's a good question and, and a statement, and I think that is, or at least the second part of that, is is a key portion of the discussion right now. Uh, starting with really the first half of that, the increase in rates maybe has made the investment decision, you know, less attractive to many. So, so I think the current environment doesn't really support that, and and you can see that in in the declining share of investor properties in our application data. But again, wanted to focus on the second half of that because I think there are a lot of moving parts to it, but it really does get us to to where we think this housing market is going to go. So what I mean by that is specifically, if you look at housing demand first, we do have lots of demographic support for for housing demand. Uh, We have demand from younger households who are looking to to move or looking to enter home ownership, whether it's because of an employment change or change in their in their stage of life, needing more space, needing to own. And to another degree, Maybe some buyers who were held out or who held off buying in 2022 when rates went from three to seven and a half percent, who are hoping that rates are, you know, were going to come down. But rates are still high, which is impacting how much people can afford. So on the demand side, I think, again, we certainly have the demand that's there, but you also need supply to match up with that. And so we know that inventory is low. Inventory of for sale properties is low. So it's competitive out there for people who are still buying. And that's keeping home price growth, I would say, still at pretty strong levels or, hold, or home, home price growth is, is holding up well. So that, too, feeds into the lack of affordability because you have rates that are still high and you have home price growth, again, that's holding up well, which takes us to the supply discussion and, and why that's so important, because this housing market really has been underbuilt since the great financial crisis and more so in the starter home segment of the market. So when you're thinking about demographics and who's buying, you know, we're looking at lots of millennial households or, or younger households who want to enter home ownership. These first time home buyers need starter homes or entry level priced homes in order to be able to afford one because they don't have an existing home to sell to fund a down payment, nor do they want a big old house that someone else might be selling. So we really need more newly constructed entry level homes to help the situation. 
Mm, and that's interesting. In one of the previous podcasts we had, we were talking about the similar situation with starter automobiles. That's that's kind of a thing that doesn't exist anymore in terms of bells and whistles on a vehicle. It's it's creating quite a crunch for that particular demographic. So let, let's uh, go back to this idea of affordability. And maybe you have some more details you can share with us about the components of the affordability index. So our affordability index is, I guess, has two, has two main parts to it. And, and before I go any further, it's called the Purchase Applications Payment Index, or like we call it PAPI. Hopefully that's easy for people to remember. So we actually put the most recent data out today, the, the, the data that we have for April. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to explain really quickly what's in there. So within the PAPI metrics, one of the main pieces is, is it's the median monthly mortgage payment for someone who is applying for a new mortgage. So it's a new purchase buyer. We take that median purchase loan amount, we apply the current mortgage rate for that month, and we have a, an estimated principal and interest payment. So again, what, what the median monthly mortgage payment is. And so we have the historical data. We can we can kind of, you know, tack on everything that we have going back to I think it's 2014 or so to show how the median payment has evolved over time. So the April numbers that we released today showed a median of about $2,100. That's up about $200 or 12% from a year ago. But maybe more significantly, that's actually up over 50% from early 2022 when rates were lower. The second component of this data series that we have, or second, I guess, set of components, is we adjust this median for income growth because we know that income growth matters. So you might actually have a period of high income growth and, and high loan size growth. But this time we're still seeing income growth lagging home price growth in the aggregate. So what that means is, yes, we're all sort of making more over time, but that growth in income is not keeping up with how quickly home prices and rates uh, have grown. So the adjusted measure or the index for the PAPI, which is an index, is up 5% over the year, which means that affordability has worsened by about 5% over the past year. Mm. This is certainly, I hate to say it, but a little bit of the perfect storm with, right. with the mortgage state of the industry. Here's another question that came in. What insights can you share about fixed rate versus adjustable rate mortgage share trends? So fixed rate loans still make up most of the volume that we're seeing. The adjustable rate share or the ARM share is about 6% of all applications as of the most recent week's data. We hit a recent high of around 12% late 2022 when we reached that I would say local sort of peak of mortgage rates getting over 7%. But that 12% arm share was still far from the 35% record that we saw in the mid 2000s. I think arms are still a good option for potential home buyers given that the rates on arms are lower than fixed rate loans. So that actually gives the borrower you know, an affordability tool, if you will. The second piece of that is the fixed period for arms now, I think Three quarters of the arms that we see have fixed periods of five, seven, or 10 years, which is a pretty good amount of time for people to have lower payments, build home equity, and, and, and not worry about refinancing. If you go back to the mid-2000s, a lot of those arms had one, two, three-year fixed periods, so not a big window for, for them to really take advantage of those low rates. It was seen more as, as sort of a you know, foot-in-the-door type product in the hopes that they'd, they'd be able to refinance pretty quickly. Since we talked about the mid-2000s, as we know, that was the period of, I would say, loose underwriting and risky lending that led to the great financial crisis. From that risk perspective, the arm loans that we see now are much less risky than what we saw then. Underwriting has been much more cautious coming out of the great financial crisis. We have much more regulatory safeguards in place, and lots of those high-risk products just don't exist anymore. And as we talked about, those longer fixed terms for arms have certainly helped so I think it's a very different time, you know, even when you do see the arm share come up. Mm. Do you think that there's still maybe between consumers or from lenders, is there still a little bit of a stigma, do you think, with the arm type of loan because of the, the financial crisis? I think there still is, maybe to a smaller degree than maybe a few years ago, I think just given that we've seen this massive run up in home prices there was talk of of a home price bubble 
And then you couple that with the affordability challenges and people then looking at arms. We, we've certainly got the question, you know, is this going to be a repeat of, of the mid-2000s? Just, again, given the, the, the trauma, and, and understandably so, because of the big fallout that we got right across the economy and even from a foreclosure and delinquency standpoint in the, in the mid to late, well, mid-2000s to 2009, 2010 or so. But again, just sort of given everything that we've run through, you know, it's a very different time. The borrowers who are getting ARM loans hopefully are, are more educated about you know, what the requirements are, right? what the timeline is for when you might have a rate increase uh, in terms of how that impacts your payments. But generally speaking, because of how different underwriting is and how good credit quality is, I think the risks are, are very different. Yeah. 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 So here's another one from our, our webinar. The industry saw a strong demand increase from 2020 to 2022. With the increase in interest rates over the past months, what do you believe the impact will be looking forward to the rest of 2023 and 2024? I'm sure there's lots to share there. <laughs> yeah. How long do we have? Uh, so recapping, I think, of some of what we've already discussed, you know, rates now are still higher than they were in 2020, 21. So that's going to continue to be a bit of a hindrance for someone who, who might be sort of looking back and saying, well, you know, I could have gotten a three and a half percent loan two years ago. Why would I get a six percent now? But we have still seen a willingness from buyers to, to buy whenever the right house comes up or if there's an opportunity maybe outside of their of their county. So I think, again, even at these current rates, um, you know, there has been movement in the housing market, if you will. And also from from people who are sick of paying high rents. I think one thing that, you know, we haven't talked about is 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 rental costs are still extremely high in many markets. And so it's a tough decision between paying a high rent or trying to buy a house with a high mortgage rate in a pretty competitive environment. That being said, you know, there have been analyses done by other sophisticated analysts in the industry showing that people have moved from more expensive urban markets to more affordable markets. So, you know, for example, you see West Coast residents moving to the middle of the country, to the Southeast. I think there's there's been there's been coverage on how much the population of Florida has grown in the past year, for example. I think if we see more newly built inventory come to the market, that will provide more options to buyers, potentially, again, more starter homes for first time home buyers. But then that also might prompt some existing owners to sell their homes, which in turn frees up another unit of inventory, which someone else can pick up. And again, causing, I guess, some kind of housing ladder or, or some you know ripple effect to, to occur that might sort of loosen the inventory a little bit more. So our forecast is for rates to settle between now and the end of the year. I said we're at about 6.7% today. Our forecast is for rates to come down to about 5.5% by the end of the year. And for for more of a recovery, I think, in the home sales market, and maybe towards the end of this year and going into next year as well, given the combination of, of sustained housing demand, lower rates, and potentially more inventory that's being built. So, we're looking ahead for a pretty strong 24 relative to this year. Yes, for sure. And and so going back to the top of our podcast where your prediction was 25% increase for next year, it sounds like what you're accounting for those percentage points is lower rates, uh, more more participants in the market. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we yep. closed, closed the loop on that. And I have one more question that I always like to ask at the end of the podcast for our guests. In all of your engagements with consulting and, and speaking with members, what do you think that you're not being asked that you should be? What would you like to share as a bit of wisdom that folks could use now? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think there are lots of thoughts running through my head. I think we've been paying a lot of attention to the challenges, and, and I think rightfully so, given that lots of our, lots of the lenders that we meet with, lots of the lenders that we talk to need to make loans to stay in business. I think there are certainly some very good strategic buy-ins out there who see this as a time of opportunity. And so volumes may not be as high as, as, as people want them to be, but it does give the lenders who are equipped time to, to figure out new opportunities. So whether it's building or, or re-engaging with their realtor and builder partners, 
or, or just even with borrowers directly or taking the time to invest in technology. We all know that sort of borrower facing technology is extremely important and also sort of the ease of process flow, if that makes sense. We, the, the mortgage process is so complicated and it's, it's, it's actually intimidating for, for lots of borrowers. So given that it is a low volume environment that it is challenging from a profitability standpoint, I think there's also time now to, to get ahead of, of the curve when it comes to, to looking for new opportunities to better the lending operation. So I think that's, that's important to think about at a time like this, especially if we look to the next year or two where we are expecting growth. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Well, thanks, Joel, thanks. for joining us today. If our audience would like to follow up with you directly, where could they find you? So you can always send me an email. Email is jkan at mba.org. Be happy to take any questions or just have a chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, tell your friends about our podcast and please subscribe. If you'd like to send our team any questions or suggested topics for the future, email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our upcoming Market Pulse webinar series. You can do that at equifax.com forward slash market pulse. We'll continue to provide relevant economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions, build resilience, and help you focus on forward. Thanks for listening and join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the Contact Us box on the Investor Relations section at Equifax.com.